Hello and welcome to this Alchemist chemistry video looking at the process known as addition polymerization. The aim of this video is to go over an overview of the process itself and then include some key examples of addition polymers, how they're formed and also what their uses are and I'm going to finish by looking at a specific example LDPE versus HDPE. So first things first, I want to give a simple overview of an addition polymerization process using some key terminology as well. So the first thing I want to talk about is some things called monomers. Monomers are small molecules, like alkenes for example, that are able to join together under very specific reaction conditions through a free radical addition mechanism. And what they form are long chain molecules. These things are known as polymers, coming from the Greek poly meaning many and mer meaning pieces. Polymers are long-chain macromolecular structures formed when many monomers covalently bond together to form a continuous long-chain molecule. Now consider you were asked to draw a representation of a polymer formed when many, many ethene monomers join together. What might be the diagram you would draw? Well, it might look a bit like this. And this representation of a polymer presents us with some clear problems. First of all, it has no defined boundaries, and secondly, it'd be very easy to get carried away and fill an entire A4 page with singly bonded carbons with hydrogens either side. It'd be kind of like writing out pi to many, many decimal places. It's kind of a fruitless or pointless exercise to do so. So there must be a smarter and a more rapid way of representing polymers. And there is, and we call it the repeating unit. The first example of a polymer repeating unit I'd like to start with is polyethene because it's a very common example, a very simple example as well. And also allow me to go through the key conventions of what you need to put into a, an equation to represent a polymer using the repeating unit. So let's start by focusing on the monomer. The monomer in this example is the molecule ethene, ethene being a member of the homologous series known as the alkenes. It's a two carbon alkene, and this is a displayed formula for the molecule ethene. Now, the first thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the fact that we've drawn an nth term in front of the monomer. Now, in this context, that means many, a nondescript number, but a large number. We are using a lot of ethene molecules to form our polymer, our polyethene, in this reaction. Now, on to the polymerization reaction itself. And the best way to consider this is to think it's as if we've taken one of the bonds of the double bond, broken it open, giving us some leading edges either side, some unbonded electrons either side of the carbons that allow this monomer unit to join on to other monomer units which have done the same thing either side and create a continuous long chain molecule. And to represent that continuation of the um, chain again and again and again in both directions around this central point, there are some key features to the repeating unit which I'm going to talk about now. The first feature of the repeating unit is that it must be only two carbons in length in your diagram, as shown here for this polyethene polymer. I'll talk about, I'll expand upon the name later. So how to draw a repeating unit really well is to imagine you're trying to draw some rugby posts except that the crossbar point of the rubber post is where the two carbons are positioned and the covalent bond between them is the crossbar itself. And then the four covalent bonds going vertically above and below each of those carbons produces the rest of the configuration of the rubber post itself. And then these empty bonds, the continuation bonds either side, um, are added on at the end. So once you've drawn your rugby post configuration, you know you're correct and your repeating unit is the right length and then the other um, conventions of the um, repeating unit can then be added in afterwards. So once your repeating unit is drawn correctly in that rugby post configuration, you then want to make sure that the elements found above and below the double bonded carbons in the monomer are also found in the same positions in the polymer. And now comes the next key convention of the um, repeating unit, which is the square brackets. Square brackets are drawn around the section which will repeat through the empty bonds, we call them, through the um, continuation bonds either side. And that helps to emphasize that this portion will repeat 
multiple times again and again and again in either direction. So it's trying to emphasize that this is a long chain which repeats this particular portion multiple times. Finally, I'm sure you've noticed there's another nth term, but this time it's after the repeating unit. And that's just there to emphasize that this repeating unit will, this portion will repeat many, many times to create our long chain polymer. And so finally, we think about naming our polymer. So the original monomer was called ethene, and this long chain molecule was comprised of many, many ethene monomers joined together. So it's given the name polyethene, which ultimately just means many ethene. It's many ethene monomers joined together. At this point, you're probably thinking, well, what's the point of doing this? Why do we bother to create these long chain molecules in the first place? Well, these molecules form the basis of our plastics industry, our non-biodegradables plastic industry, which first emerged in the 50s and 60s. And this particular plastic, polyethene, is commercially known as polythene. And it is the basis of the plastic carrier bags we use for our day-to-day -day shopping purposes. And of course, we're trying to use these less and less because of their non-environmentally friendly credentials and the fact that they aren't biodegradable. But occasionally, when we find ourselves caught short of the shops and without a bag in hand, our plastic bags tend to be still quite useful. So polythene plastic bags still a very um, common product when we're out and about in our everyday lives. On to example number two. This one is called chloroethene, and you can probably see why. It's essentially an ethene molecule but with one hydrogen substituted out for a chlorine atom. Again, we have the nth term in front to say that there are many of these chloroethene monomers present in the polymerization reaction. Under the correct conditions, those monomers will join together to form the polymer, polychloroethene, and look again at the key conventions of the repeating unit. The repeating unit is two carbons long. It has that rugby post configuration, the same elements found in the monomer are found in the polymer in the same positions. We have our continuation bonds either side, square brackets going through the continuation bonds, and the nth term afterwards, emphasizing that this repeating unit will repeat multiple times to create the long chain configuration. Now the uses of polychloroethene are mainly linked to the fact that it's a highly waterproof plastic, and so the most common use you will see around us is it's used in PVC, polyvinyl chloride, guttering on houses and other buildings. So it's a hard wearing, durable, waterproof plastic. Example number three is one of my favorites here, tetrafluoroethene and polytetrafluoroethene. Just before I talk about these, it does bring up some key nomenclature for us. That is the numbering system in chemistry if there's more than one heteroatom, more than one atom that isn't hydrogen attached to an organic molecule like an alkene, for example. And the system is, if there's two atoms other than hydrogen attached, we use the prefix di. If there are three heteroatoms, three atoms that aren't hydrogen attached to the organic molecule, we use the prefix tri. And if there are four groups other than hydrogen attached to the particular organic molecule, we use the term tetra, meaning four. Kind of linked to the game Tetris, which is a puzzle game linked to there being four blocks together to create the various shapes you try and manipulate in the game itself. So polytetrafluoroethene actually has some really interesting applications commercially. It turns out that it's actually a really unreactive polymer, even though fluorine is commonly one of the most reactive elements we ever investigate, the carbon fluorine bond in the polymer is incredibly difficult to break. It's a very strong bond, short bond with a high bond enthalpy, and it means that polytetrafluoroethene isn't particularly reactive, and also it won't break down at high temperatures. That's really important for its use. It turned out this polymer formed a non-stick coating, which was heat resistant. Now commercially, this is known as Teflon, and you'll find this as a coating on many kitchen utensils, including frying pans. 
and it's a non-stick coating allows you to cook food without any risk of that food sticking to the pan. And it made chemical com companies back in the 60s and 70s loads and loads of money because it was such a revolutionary idea. The final example I'd to finish with is polypropene. I've chosen to finish here because it's often an example of a polymer which will catch students out. Let's start off by looking at the monomer propene. Propene is a three carbon alkene monomer molecule. And I put my nth term in front to show that there are many propene molecules involved in forming this polymer repeating unit. Under the correct and suitable conditions, we have a polymerization reaction taking place and we form our polymer, our long chain molecule. Now drawing polypropene correctly requires us to correctly use the rugby post configuration. If a student were to forget to use that and they drew a repeating unit which was three carbons in a row, because of course propene is a three carbon molecule, that would seem logical at the time, it would be incorrect. Because if you imagine doing that, drawing out a three carbons in a row, you'd have carbon, single bond, carbon, single bond, carbon, and hydrogens above and below the carbons. It would look structurally identical when repeated multiple times to polyethene. And of course, polypropene is not structurally identical to polyethene. It is a different mon it is a different monomer and therefore a different polymer. So we must draw this correctly. My advice would be this. Start by drawing the rugby post configuration first, i.e. carbon covalently bonded to carbon in the center, our crossbar, and then four covalent bonds above and below those carbons with nothing drawn on them yet. Then transpose across the elements or the group of atoms shown above and below the carbon atoms in the monomer into the polymer. So I draw a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here, but here on the top of this right-hand carbon, I would draw the CH3 group. So I draw a CH3 group here, I draw a CH3 group here. So I still have a three carbon um, portion, but the third carbon is drawn above the two carbons that make up the repeating unit. Now the rest of the conventions come in, square brackets around that repeating unit, and then the nth term afterwards to show that this will repeat multiple times. And that is the correct configuration for polypropene because it won't accidentally look identical to polyethene if it was drawn incorrectly. Now, the uses of polypropene are it's pretty durable. Uh, it's used to create rope, actually. So it's used to create polymer ropes. Before I elaborate on the commercial examples of low density and high density polyethene and the products they form, great opportunity for me to say, if you found this video useful and you find other videos on the channel useful, please do think about giving us a like, thinking about subscribing to the channel, or maybe even ringing the bell to keep notified of our ongoing videos and content. Really trying to build up a library of useful chemistry tutorials for the community and your Support is always hugely appreciated, and thank you very much in advance. If we investigate and delve into a particular example of an addition polymer in greater detail, polyethene, for example, it might strike you that polyethene is a pretty varied product. Some polyethene products are incredibly weak and incredibly easily ripped and, and broken. So plastic carrier bags are not exactly a a resilient material, you can tear through a plastic bag with great ease. So that would imply that it's a weak structure. But then again, polyethene is also used to make large scale plastic milk crates and the plastic milk bottles you might find in your fridge. Now I think you'd struggle to tear through those. So there must be a structural difference between polyethene found in polyethene bags and the polyethene found in the bottles you're storing in your fridge right now for your milk. And there is. There is a difference in their manufacturing processes which fundamentally changes their structural arrangement and therefore influences their physical properties. And I'm going to take you through the processes that produce these two different types of polyethene and the products they therefore lead to. So the first form of polyethene I take you through is known as low density polyethene or LDPE for short. Now this is formed industrially under relatively high temperature conditions, 200 degrees centigrade, using an oxygen initiator. The free radical addition mechanism tends to lead to quite random branching of the polymer chains in their formation. So what you get is a structure that looks kind of like this 
if you were to look at it at a microscopic or even beyond microscopic level. And the way we describe this sort of structure is that it's amorphous. It isn't regular, it isn't crystalline, it's very higgledy-piggledy and random in nature. There is extensive branching. There is extensive side branching of chains coming away from the long linear chains of the uh, extending polymer itself. This leads to it having a relatively low melting point and producing a flexible plastic material at the end of its manufacturing process. And that's because of the way these polymer chains interact with other polymer chains around them. They are not going to form particularly efficient or effective intermolecular forces between these chains and other chains around them because of the great amount of space created by the branching. Less efficient packing, less efficient um, compacting of the polymer chains together leads to the formation of fewer and weaker intermolecular forces between those polymer chains. That's going to mean they're going to be separated with greater ease under heating, hence lower melting point, and also they will be less resistant to sudden shearing forces applied to them when you rip a plastic bag, for example. But they will have quite a lot of flexibility and stretch in them still. So they're kind of ideal for producing plastic carrier bags, which can take a certain amount of weight and flex around and stretch without necessarily ripping straight away, but overload them and they certainly will tear. Now compare that previous diagram to the structure of high density polyethene or HDPE and what will strike you straight away I would imagine is just how organized and linear and compacted these polymer chains are in the high density polyethene. Now high density polyethene is produced under very different conditions to low density polyethene. Usually the temperatures are much lower but the pressures are much higher to compact and push uh, these polymer chains together, but also to create this regular and very ordered and very well structured um, situation, we use a catalyst called a Ziegler Natter catalyst, which helps to lower the expansion energy for the process to occur, but also again is preferential in producing these linear and well compacted chains. What you find about the structure of high density polyethene is it is crystalline in nature, that means it's regular and well organized. There is little evidence of branching in this structure. These are linear chains that can get very close together. This will lead to a high melting point and a much greater level of rigidity in the plastic produced at the end of this process. And that's because these polymer chains can form very effective weak intermolecular forces along the surface area of their linear chains. You're gonna get a lot of intermolecular forces and reasonably strong weak intermolecular forces along these linear polymer chains which are compacted close together. So high density polyethene lends itself to be used to manufacture much more rigid and much more um, resilient plastic products like plastic milk bottles and even the plastic crates that surround uh, glass milk bottles when they're delivered by a traditional milkman to your home. So there you have it guys. That is a full summary of addition polymerization including lots and lots of examples of how to draw polymer repeating units and hopefully some reasonably interesting explanations of the differences between low density and high density polyethene. Really fantastic talking to you and I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. Goodbye.